Uchoroev Goler, Lukos Makanertni is Anam Dom, Agus Inu Torme, a kind fui and Oklish in Erin, Sa von Ish. So welcome everyone. My name is Luke McInerney, and today I'll speak about the church in early medieval Ireland. This lecture was initially delivered in August 2021 on the island of Valencia in County Kerry. I have taken the liberty of extending the lecture somewhat and therefore enabling me to delve into further detail around some points that I initially could only give cursory attention to. Notwithstanding this, I should emphasize that the purpose of this lecture is to give what will invariably be but a superficial coverage to a large and complex topic. I hope that by giving this lecture and this overview, I can inspire or motivate you to embark on your own study of the period and the themes raised here today. But I'd also advise that whilst study and knowledge of the sources is critical to, un to gain a sound understanding of this period, it's not the only way to grapple with some of the central historical questions. In my opinion, visiting the sites under study is an irreplaceable way to imbue oneself into the landscape and context of early medieval Ireland. Ireland is, of course, very fortunate to have a number of well-preserved sites which are accessible to visit. And so as I go through the lecture today, I'll be touching on a number of these places. I would therefore encourage you to get out into the fields and witness the sites for your very self. So today's lecture will provide a brief overview of the early Irish church. I have structured the presentation in the following way, divided into five specific areas. As you can see on the slide in front of you, the first part is an introduction. The second part is early beginnings. In the third part, we look at consolidation of the church. In the fourth part, the golden age. And in the fifth part, reform and change. So the purpose of today's lecture is to provide a somewhat superficial yet wide ranging survey of the early Irish church. Given the complexity of the topic and the competing ev evidence which is available, I've had to be judicious with what I've included here today. So with this caveat up front, the main purpose is to introduce the idea of the early Irish church and how it was organized, who were its personnel and what were its distinctive features. At a minimum, I hope to instill in you a spark of interest so that you can follow up on some of the themes which I'll only touch on. At this juncture, it's important to set out what this lecture is and what it is not. I'll tackle the last bit of that statement first. This is not a lecture about the so-called Celtic church. This phrase will of course be well known to you, but is an, a relatively imprecise term. And many of you will be aware of books that purport to explain how the early church in Ireland was somehow heterodox with doctrines that reflected what we may deem modern sensibilities around such concerns as environmentalism and feminism, among many others. Indeed, for some 19th century Protestants, the idea of a Celtic church linked back to an ancient time that was somehow pure and devoid of Roman influence, with devolved structures and flattened hierarchies that reflected post-Reformation ecclesiological realities. None of this really stands up against the historical evidence. On the contrary, when we read the writings of the Irish, of the early Irish church, we are struck by its general conformity with the rest of Christendom, not least its hierarchical structures and its complex collection of church canons and writings that mention the threefold ministry of deacon, priest, and bishop. Also clerical ordination and the link to the papacy as a final arbitrator in disputes when local synods were undecided. Taken together, the evidence is clear that the Irish church was by no means an unorthodox branch of the Latin church, despite perhaps the tainted views of later commentators, such as Geraldus Cambrensis and others. The Irish church's conformity is of no great surprise, of course, and the personnel in the Irish church, while conscious of living at the edge of the world, to quote a phrase used by St Columbanus himself, were very aware of being part of a universal church and which the Irish, at its most extreme Western edge, was a member of the Western Latin churches in both tradition and in jurisdiction. And of course, the belief in the real presence during the Eucharistic sacrament was always adhered to by the Irish church. All of this, in my view, is enough 
for us to refute those 19th century writings that saw in a so-called Celtic church, a form of proto-Protestantism in doctrinal substance or ecclesiological form. So this brings me onto my more substantive point, what this lecture actually is. It is an introduction to the early Irish church and it attempts to make sense of the massive documentary and physical evidence that exists from this very formative period in Irish history. It also tries to help explain the interlinkages between Latin and vernacular literacy and the church, as well as provide a context to the development of monasteries and ecclesiastical settlements from eremitic origins to the great monasteries and churches, which some of them became. When I say early, I am specifically referring to the period of conversion in the 430s through to around the 1100s. From the 1100s, we see the convening of a number of important Irish church synods, which implemented a series of reforms that saw a significant change in the governance and institutional structure of the Irish church. In some ways, elements of the pre 12th century church continued well beyond the changes of that century, indeed down to the late 16th or early 17th century. But today I'll generally confine my comments to the period which historians call the early medieval historical period which will bring us up to the 1100s. As I've just mentioned, by the 1100s, things changed dramatically. First with the implementation of the Gregorian reforms in Ireland, and then with the Norman invasion of 1169. The env enviable position of studying the early Irish church for medievalists is not that there are too few sources, but in many ways, there are actually too many, which makes it quite a challenge to make sense of it all. This is, an this is unparalleled in the post-Roman period and reflects the uniqueness of the Irish experience. Ireland, of course, was never conquered by Rome and yet by the fifth century had embra embraced Christianity at a time when it was pushed out and much reduced in England and five centuries before Christianity took hold in many parts of, of North, Central and Eastern Europe. Another unparalleled development is that the Irish not being Latin speakers, had to learn Latin as a second language. And in doing so, they not only produced some of Western Europe's finest Latinists during this period under study, but they also set out to write their own language, Old Irish, and even to produce treatises on grammar and vocabulary. In doing so, the Irish were the earliest people in Europe to write in the vernacular since the fall of Rome. This is a significant fact and probably owed something to the fact that Ireland was never subjugated by Rome and thus the vernacular was never supplanted or made inferior. On the contrary, the Irish held their own language in high esteem and took great pains to link its origins to the biblical story about the Tower of Babel. The conversion to Christianity in Ireland saw great advances in both literature and science, making Irish monasteries and scholars some of the most important contributors to European intellectual life during this period. I will demonstrate this as we proceed through today's lecture. I've mentioned that we have many sources to study the early Irish church. So what are those sources? I've listed a number on this slide to give an indication of some of those sources. So for example, we have seventh century saints lives, consider the life of St. Bridget or the life of St. Patrick, or the very detailed life of Colum Killer from the early eighth century. There are references in the Irish annals, which were composed at various monasteries, and many writings have been also preserved in continental monasteries founded by Irish clerics. Think of St. Gallen in Switzerland or Regensburg in Germany. Some writings of the Irish church were very popular, such as the Voyage of St. Brendan, which became a bestseller in medieval Europe. Aspects of Dante's Inferno are said to derive from allusions of hell and the afterlife, contained in the 10th century vernacular text, the vision of Adovnan. And finally, we have physical evidence all around us, not just of ecclesiastical ruins, but also of stone iconography on high crosses. Indeed, the ubiquitous existence of holy wells, of kilines, and other places of devotion linked to early church foundations and to their founders and saints. But the most common, and what I want to briefly touch on here now, are Irish place names. Religiously imbued place names are found throughout Ireland and in a great many instances port, point to early church sites and foundations. I would hazard a guess that Ireland surpasses most European countries in terms of the sheer volume of place names with links to the early church. <laughs> 
I'll talk more about place names in my next slide. It's also important to recognize that an understanding of the Irish church has changed over time. The translation and indeed publication of a lot of material, especially Irish language materials, has enabled us to understand the workings of the early Irish church better and to see that its doctrines were, with relatively few exceptions, in step with the universal church and that many of its personnel, especially in the period of the seventh to 10th centuries, were very impressive with a reach well beyond the territorial confines of Ireland. Not only was this small island on the westerly fringe of Europe responsible for the initial Christianization of much of Scotland and Northern England, but also parts of Bavaria and Northern France. And that the monastic schools in Ireland made an outstanding contribution in the fields of Latin grammar, mathematics, geography, philosophy, and arguably Greek learning. And all of this from a people who were never subjects of the Roman Empire. So the story of the early Irish church is an extraordinary story that deserves to be told. The first thing to note is that any study of the early Irish church needs to take account of the two languages used during this period. The Irish church regarded itself as a constituent part of the Western church. And to this end, the liturgical language was of course Latin. Many documents, including the three writings ascribed to St. Patrick, along with various saints lives, were written in Latin. At the same time, the Irish wrote in their own language, which in the period of our study was known as Shan Gwelga, or Old Irish. Irish is the oldest vernacular language written in the post-Roman Empire period in Western Europe. And we have many early writings produced by Irish clerics in that language. What I wish to present here is a general guide for reading the Irish landscape, so as to help identify those links to the early Irish church. There's no better way to do this than via onomastics, that is the study of place names. I have some examples on this slide in front of you, both the place names that directly invoke early church settlements, and also words that have made it into, our, into modern surnames, but which have invariably an ecclesiastical link. I shan't call out all of these, but just some of them. So we have Kel or Kill in modern Irish, from the Latin Kel, meaning church or cemetery. And one example of this would be Kildara or Kildare, uh, denoting the church of the oak or the oak, oak constructed church. We have Donach, meaning a church building from the Latin Dominicum. And one example of this would be the suburb of, of Dublin, uh, Donach Brock or, or Donnybrook. Monaster, meaning monastery, from the Latin monasterium. And we have an example of this in the place name of Monaster Boyce. And Dishart, meaning hermitage, from the Latin desertium. And one example of this would be the place name in Central Clare uh, called today Dysart Tula or Dishart Tula. Espog, meaning bishop, from the Latin episcopus. And we have the surname Magili Espog or Gillespie derived from this. And Sugget which means priest from the Latin Sacerdos. And we have the Irish surname Makantagat or McTaggart, meaning the son of the priest. When we survey the early medieval church, it is instructive to not simply look at the church buildings, but also where they were located. The geography of ecclesiastical settlement says a lot about the first few centuries of Christianization in Ireland, and especially during the six to eight centuries. If we look at many of the monasteries and cathedrals that became prominent in later times, many were originally built on important communication routes. This, of course, is not surprising, as these communities needed access to the outside world in order to procure materials for manuscript production, and most importantly, for, for any monastic community, um, to procure wine for the celebration of the liturgy, as well as food and other necessities required for a monastic community to flourish. But when we survey many of the names of early monastic sites, we find a high proportion contain the word clune from the Irish meaning watery meadow. meadow. The best example is Clonvignoish or Clonmacnoise. We also find other names which are prominent, such as Ross from the Irish meaning a wood, such as we find in the place name Kilrush or Kilrosh, a town just opposite St. Senan's monastic site at Scattery Island in County Clare. The reason I'm mentioning this is because these names reveal something about the topography 
and in turn reveal information about how these early church sites might have originally come into being. We know that many churches were situated on boundary lands between kingdoms and that such land was often marginal land or land that was used for a variety of communal purposes, such as inauguration ceremonies, military hostings, fairs or enochs, and other large scale gatherings. It would appear that many of the monasteries originated in land grants made by rulers to the church and which had an element of marginality to them. They were often on boundaries and often associated with marginal land, such as watery meadows. Hence, many of them have the place name, the, the element clune in their place name. Granting land to the church on a kingdom's boundaries was consistent with the idea of boundary zones being a place for communal activity and probably areas not heavily inhabited all very good reasons to situate a church or a monastic community. In some cases, we have evidence that church sites were granted by one kingly dynasty to the church in order to neutralize the land so that its rivals could not enjoy, enjoy that, that land. An example of this would be the Rock of Cashel, which served for a period of time as a metropolitan archbishopric of Southern Ireland and was granted by the Dalgash dynasty to the church, despite it once being a royal fortress of the Ogunokta kings of Munster, who were the main rivals to the Delgash. We also find that the sighting of monasteries, especially the larger ones, shows that many were clustered in the Irish Midlands and South Ulster. This is particularly the case in the 10th and 11th centuries. It has been explained by some historians that this geography reflected trade and communication routes. It is probably no coincidence that it was from these monasteries that we find a flowering of literature in the pre 11th century period. Their scriptoria were especially active on the eve of the 12th century reforms of the Irish church, which we'll touch on uh, later in this talk. Continuing on the theme of place names, we are fortunate that the building materials of the early Irish churches have been preserved in the Irish language, enabling us to get a sense of what these structures ostensibly were like and how they were constructed. We have the form Dara, meaning oak, in the place name Kildara or Kildare, denoting a church built of oak. We also encounter the place name Ardmore in respect to an ecclesiastical establishment which was founded by St Declan in County Waterford. And this derives itself from the meaning of Ard, meaning high and big or more, so the, the, the church, the large church on the heights. And certainly St. Declan's Monastery of Ardmore lives up to that meaning, it being perched on a high spot with commanding views yonder towards the sea. So the study of place names can reveal evidence of early Christian settlement in Ireland, and in some circumstances, reveal the building materials or physical attributes of these individual churches. Most Irish churches and monastic settlements of the period under discussion appear to have been constructed from wood and generally from oak. There is some evidence to show that early churches were also built from earth and the results from excavations show that stone churches were often preceded by timber ones. If we look at the general um, references in the, in the Irish annals, it's quite clear that until the 11th century, churches that were generally of wooden construction were the norm, while stone built churches often represented as primary churches and were regarded as the exception. This pattern of building and the siting of stone churches, of course, reflected invariably local conditions. And we may suppose that in some stony regions, for example, in the Burren in County Clare, or the Aran Islands or parts of Connemara, stone built churches may have been constructed earlier than those found in, founded in Lin Leinster or in South Munster, where wood was much more plentiful. Many of these stone churches shared common characteristics such as pre-Romanesque features like cyclopedian masonry in their construction work. This was a particular technique that used large stones that were not laid in horizontal courses. Many such examples survive today, although often intermingled with later masonry courses, which have tended to obscure the original masonry patterns of these, of these churches. So from this point in the lecture, I want to guide us through the Christianization of Ireland and in subsequent slides, we'll touch on church organization and the consolidation of church, as well as 
discuss some of its more notable saints and the literary production of the great monastic schools. The earliest documentation that we have about the Christianization of Ireland refers to Bishop Palladius, who was from Gaul or modern day France, and who was sent to, and I quote, Irish believers in Christ as their first bishop. This appears as an entry under the year 431 in the Chronicle of Prosper of Aquitaine, and it indicates that Palladius's mission to Ireland was endorsed by the Pope, which meant that it was an official mission with specific aims. What is striking from this reference is that it suggests that there was already a community living in Ireland that was Christian, and perhaps they were of a size that required a bishop. So the question we must ask ourselves is, why do you send a bishop to such a community? The intention may have been to establish the first diocese in Ireland. A bishop was needed to consecrate churches and to ordain priests and deacons. Of the Christian community in Ireland at this time, there, almost nothing is known, but we can speculate that they were trading with Gaul and cognizant of Christianity and its teachings. Later legend states that Palladius's mission was somewhat of a failure and that it was not, and that it was primarily confined to the southern part of Ireland around the county of Waterford. This would support the theory that the community had links with Gaul on the basis that it is presumed that Christianity reached Ireland via these early links. Almost no visible trace of Palladius's mission has survived. There are no church remains, writings or liturgical books. There is, however, an Easter table which sets out the calculation of the Easter date. This is an, an important piece of evidence because it shows the calculation was based on an 84 year cycle, reflecting the methods devised in the third and fourth century in northern Italy, Italy and also in Gaul. So this is a first tangible link between Irish Christians and the church in Gaul and its practices. But of course, it is St. Patrick to whom we credit the conversion of Ireland to. It is difficult to overemphasize the uniqueness of the patrician mission and the importance of Patrick's own writings. In fact, his writings are unparalleled in Western Europe as an account of a man who was held captive beyond the frontiers of Rome and who documented it. I will assume that we all know the story of his capture at the age of 16 when he was brought to Ireland as a slave, himself being the son of a Romano British administrator and deacon in a local church, and also Patrick's own uh, origins, possibly from Cumbria in Northwest England. Patrick's escape and subsequent return to Ireland in the year 432 is what hagiographers have generally focused on. And rather uniquely, we have in his own hand, his confessio or his confession. This remarkable document shows that his missionary activity was mainly centered on Northeast and Northwest Ireland. During his missions, he was active in baptizing converts and in leaving followers here and there to establish new churches. We know that his followers were a motley crew consisting of former Druids and nobles, as well as some British followers. We have direct evidence of this in the persons of St. Mokta, of Secundinus and Auxiliaris, all, all three of whom were Britons and who established early churches in Ireland. But aside from Patrick's own writing, there are no reliable records for the fifth century which would shed light on how the church was forming at that very early stage. We don't reliably know how many bishops there were. Later documents would describe a number of 150, but this is probably an apocryphal figure. And generally, we don't know what types of communities sprung up around these early foundations. Whilst we have churchmen in the middle of the sixth century being very proficient in Latin, we don't know how the foundations of biblical scholarship and Latin learning were first put in place by Patrick's mission or indeed by his immediate successors. On the surface, it looks like Ireland was converted relatively quickly. Its proximity to Britain and the Roman Empire would have meant that the Irish and their Druids and their intellectual class knew about Christianity. And so this receptiveness probably helped it spread at least amongst the elite. Certainly, the country could be considered converted by the year 600. And yet later in that century, legislation from local church synods suggests that the Druids were still about, although the reference to them suggests that they were probably becoming marginalized by that time. The flurry of church records from the 700s indicates the church by that stage was confident and active and took a leading part in secular politics and law.
This does not mean that the pre-Christian folk tradition and beliefs were completely suppressed. Of course, we have in Ireland much evidence of this continuing down to the so-called devotional revolution of the mid 19th century in the form of Beltaner and Lunasa traditions, as well as other folk practices that long persisted. But the evidence would seem to show that official or organized pre-Christian beliefs were by the eighth century more or less eclipsed by Christianity and had been certainly on the back foot for a considerable time before that. We may, we may suppose that it was around about 150 years from the time of St. Patrick's mission um, for Christianity to become an established religion of the people. One can speculate on the reasons for this relatively quick conversion. The prestige of Latin Christianity owed much to its early links to the Roman Empire. This would have made it an, an attractive proposition to the native elite as a cultural phenomenon. Christianity is very much a religion of the book, and this stands in contrast to the pantheon of Celtic gods worshipped by the Irish at the time of Patrick, but which there is very little in terms of written accounts. The strong link between Christianity and literacy conferred a status on the new religion, but also its unique moral framework, whereby women and slaves were liberated, um, was quite a revolutionary, revolutionary uh, philosophy, and it also offered a different type of an idealized life for aristocratic women who are often traded as commodities in dynastic marriage settlements. Patrick himself must have had unique appeal. During his time as a slave, he learned to, to speak Old Irish and he could address converts directly. At his confrontation with Lyra, the high king, in his stronghold at Tara, St. Patrick converted the king's chief poet and brehen, or lawgiver, a man by the name of Dofok. There is a reference in the Irish annals which states that upon his conversion, Dofok and Patrick revised a corpus of Irish law called the Shanachus Ma in order to ensure that it complied with Christianity. This is a significant story because it demonstrates that a fusion of the native intelligentsia, the poets and the lawyers, with Christianity occurred at quite an early stage and it wasn't simply the case of an external imposition of Christianity and its resultant changes on law and society, but rather from the beginning, we see an acculturation of Christianity within the native culture, a situation that gave rise to an element of syncretism, especially in the literary tradition that followed. We have many examples of pagan poets and druids converting and becoming monks. Perhaps the most emphatic example of this was a poet turned churchman Cormon MacLeanin of Cloyne in East Cork, who was born around the year 530 and who is credited with having written some of the earliest poems in Irish in the second half of the sixth century. Cormon MacLeanin was an accomplished filler or poet who wrote a poem of thanks to the King of Tara for a gift of a sword. And in the 560s, he met St. Brendan of Clonfort and under his influence, Cormon entered the religious life after which he founded his chief ecclesiastical foundation at Cloyne, and where a school of poetry may have also been founded, suggesting the interconnection, even intermeshing between the native schools and their scholarship in poetry with the scholarship of the church and its Latin learning. While in the case of Colman MacLeanin, we see the influence of the Philly or poets in the church at this very early period, the general view is that their influence in the church was especially evident from the eighth century onwards. It is probably no coincidence that the Philae became associated with the church at this stage, as it, as an institution, had moved away from its initial diocesan based structure to a more decentralized structure, which had come to characterize it by that period. At any rate, it is significant that a cross fertilization between the native intelligentsia and the church occurred. Although perhaps this was nothing too exceptional, but rather a natural progression given that literacy is what bound these groups of learned men together. And in this context, it would be normal that the church as an institution, which was at the same time a repository of learning, attracted the talents of the literate native intelligentsia, such as the poets, the lawyers, and the historians. The story of Coleman MacLeanin and others like him show a continuity with the traditions of the past. And that with some reshaping to ensure compliance with Christianity, these traditions and laws could be adapted for a Christian society. I suspect that the success of the conversion process can be attributed to the flexibility 
and a de degree of acculturation, which I mentioned earlier, demonstrated by these first missions to the native culture, to say nothing about the appeal of Christianity from a moral standpoint or its rich literary and broad intellectual tradition, which must have had particular appeal to the intellectual class. The last thing to return to is a point that we had pondered earlier. Was the Irish church a Gallic or a British church? At the risk of sitting on the fence, and we ought to be careful in making any definitive pronouncement as the evidence for this early period is anything but definitive, it would seem that the Irish church in the fifth century enjoyed influences from both the Gallic and the British church. Given that Patrick was from Britain, and the Latin used for centuries later in Ireland was insular Latin, that is Latin primarily with a British pronunciation, it seems axiomatic that the church continued to maintain links with Britain. With the onset of the pagan Anglo-Saxons in, in England in the sixth century, those links came under strain. But some aspects of the Irish church also shows Gallic influence, not least the Irish church's interest, interest in the cult of St. Martin of Tours and the writings of Isidore of Seville, which may have come to Ireland via Gaul. Perhaps it was a diversity of these traditions at this early period, which contributed to the flowering of the Irish church in subsequent centuries. Certainly the breadth and scope of writings by Irish clerics showed a broad intellectual curiosity that must have been nourished by a number of different foreign influences and practices that cannot be attributed to simply one source or one church tradition. Of course, the Irish church also benefited from wide influences from within the universal church as the writings of the patristic fathers and historians of church history demonstrate, all of which are evidenced in the Irish church canons who quote quite liberally from these sources. Some of these sources must have been intermediated via the Gallic church, which had links with the Mediterranean world. So the picture that we have of the fifth to seventh centuries is quite mixed with a multiplicity of influences brought to bear on the Irish church. One of the abiding questions is the knowledge of Greek in the Irish church and whether it can be attributed to links with the Gallic church or quite possibly the British church via a school established in Canterbury under the Greek Archbishop Theodore of Tarsus in the 670s, and which was famed for its instruction of students in both Greek and Latin. We're therefore left wondering if Greek learning was at least in part derived from Irish students involved in the Canterbury School, and thus one of the many links between the Irish and the British church at this period. In this slide, I'm going to touch on church organization. Up front, I should caveat my lecture here that church organization is a complicated topic which invariably changed over time. My purpose is just to give a flavor to some of the current thinking about the organization of the early medieval uh, church in Ireland. Like other organizations, the Irish church during the period was influenced by centrifugal factors as well as other factors that worked in the opposite direction. I'll explore some of these in the time that we have today. We are fortunate that we have physical evidence of what these early church sites look like. Indeed, even after more than a millennium, we can use basic mapping to identify this evidence. Using satellite viewing Google Maps, we can find in the Irish countryside numerous examples of the circular enclosures of the early church sites. In the town of Armagh in Ulster, for example, the street pattern around the Church of Ireland Cathedral follows the ancient curvilinear shape of the original enclosure of the monastic site. This basic pattern is referred to in a poem from the 13th century, when the Bardic poet Gilabrija Mokonmi describes Armagh's church as a rounded edifice, which could also be translated as a rounded wall. He may very well have been describing elements of the older circular enclosure that were incorporated into the later church building but were still visible to the poet when he wrote those verses in the mid 13th century. We can see a similar shape in the road that skirts around the monastic site of Lora in North Tipperary, tracing what would have been the outer enclosure of that monastic settlement originally associated with St. Rouen. Another good example is Kilterranen ecclesiastical settlement near the galway Clare border on the County Galway side. Here we can see a circular enclosure that was partitioned within, separating different areas, which presumably had different functions within the enclosure. 
Such functions would have included living quarters for the church's clerics, as well as areas to provide hospitality to guests. Originally, these monasteries were enclosed by a vallum or a ditch rampart, which helped to physically separate the monastic community from the secular world. In some sites, we find reliquary shrines, and these were originally positioned close to the primary church, such as we, such as we find at the 12th century stone church of Temple Cronin in the Burren. Here situated two gabled slab shrines, which may date from as early as the seventh or eighth century and possibly held the bones of the church's founding saint. Therefore, having a concourse for pilgrims and in a larger monastic settlement, indeed a guest house to provide hospitality was important. On this slide in front of you, we can see aerial images of a number of ecclesiastical settlements of varying sizes and importance. The common feature, of course, is a curvilinear enclosure, which can clearly be discerned from the images. Here I've included aerial images of Armagh, Kilternan, and Nendrum. Note the street pattern around Armagh Cathedral, which betrays the original monastic enclosure and also the internal partitions, which can be seen in the enclosure also at Kilternan. In the third image, we have Nendrum, which is a notable, which is notable for its early seventh century, sorry, seventh century tidal mill. It presents an excellent example of a double enclosure within which stands a church building, a high tower and other structures. The origins of these circular enclosures in which monastic communities built their primary church and living quarters is somewhat debated. Some of these enclosures appear to have been secular settlements that were gifted to the church. <clears throat> we have direct evidence of this phenomenon in saints' lives. For instance, in the life of Makrihi or Beher Vakrihi, we read in his church, we read that his church at Kilmakrihi near Liz Canna in the west of County Clare was donated by a, the local king of Corcoran Row, it previously having served as that king's royal fort. There are other instances in the surviving literature of secular sites becoming monastic establishments. Local rulers saw the advantage of having a monastery situated on their own land. And apart from benefits that could accrue as a site of culture and of learning, the tarman or the sanctuary lands of the church could serve as a place of refuge Monasteries also function as places where movable wealth could be safely stored. Another factor for the prevalence of circular enclosures is the fact that weaker lineages who had little chance of achieving political power or who had been ousted from power by more powerful lineages, sometimes attempted to gain prestige by setting themselves up and the homesteads as a monastic community. In this way, whole families embrace the monastic life, and in doing so, we may suppose that previously enclosed secular sites, the rats and the ring forts, with their delineated boundaries, etc., made for a convenient design for a new monastic community. We're told in the sources that in the center of the, these monastic communities was an oratory church, often single-celled, the chancel coming often many centuries later, when there was a greater differentiation required between the laity who stood in the nave and the clerics officiating. The earliest churches were constructed from wood, and as I mentioned earlier, chiefly from oak. In the seventh century, we have a description of St. Bridget's church in Kildare, or Kildara, which states that the church was very high and divided by a wooden partition. One partition stretched across the church near, the, near to the altar, and we are told was covered with painted images. This would have created a designated holy space near the altar, otherwise the sanctissimus, the most holy place. Another partition divided the floor of the church into two areas. It appears that women and men entered the floor of the church into two specific areas and were segregated when they were within the church. The description also says that on either side of the altar were interred the remains of St. Bridget, its renowned foundress, and Conleth, her bishop. The description also mentions that such was the popularity of Kildare that it became a civitas or a city by virtue of the people flocking to live around the monastic site. In another detailed account, we can glimpse the inside of an early medieval oratory and its type of construction. 
According to a description that features in the rather enigmatic Latin work known as Hisperca Famina, which was written perhaps in the early 660s, a wooden oratory church was, and I quote, fashioned out of candle shaped beams. It has sides joined by four fold fastenings. The square foundations of the said temple gave it stability from which spring a solid beamwork of massive enclosure. It has a vaulted roof above. Square beams are placed in the ornamental roof. It has a holy altar in the center on which the assembled priests celebrate the mass. It has a single entrance from the Western boundary, which is closed by a wooden door that seals the warmth. An assembly of planks comprise the extensive portico. There are four steeples at the top. The chapel contains innumerable objects. These descriptions of early churches begs a question as to how large were these early monastic communities and what did they base themselves off as a standard model of that community? Were the buildings derived from a standard model that had been adapted to Irish conditions or were they simply imposed from a model known elsewhere or perhaps changed to suit the Irish climate and, and culture? An early poem suggests that a church community could consist of 12 clerics. This was probably an idealized um, statement in that it mirrored the 12 apostles. The poem gives us a useful description of the size of a church in that it should accommodate six men, six clerics on either side of its walls, reciting the Psalter. And I quote, four files of three or three of four to give the Psalter forth, six to pray by the south church wall and six along the north. According to the 15th century vernacular text, the miracles of St. Senon or Shannon, the community at Scattery Island two centuries earlier, so in the 13th century, was envisaged to have consisted of, and I quote, seven score psalm singing elders in his household with great, great courses, without plowing, without reaping, without drying, without any activity except study. What is interesting from this reference is a last sentence, which shows a reverence to the work of study. This and the focus on psalm singing by St. Senon's monastics reminds us of the Benedictine motto of ora et labora. We also read a valuable passage in the 10th century vernacular life of St. Patrick, that Patrick had set out a standard size for his church settlements. For example, the furta or burial ground measured, measured 100, 140 feet in its enclosure, or the great house, the tick moor, measured 27 feet in length and 17 feet in its back or protected space and seven feet in its oratory. These measurements were not haphazard, but were laden with biblical symbolic meaning. We read in chapter one of the first book of the Kings of Kings in the Old Testament that Solomon partitioned off 20 cubits at the rear of the temple with cedar boards from floor to ceiling to form within the temple an inner sanctuary, the most holy place. So this partitioning off of space in the Jewish temple may have been the model for St. Patrick and his foundations, creating a designated space within a monastic community or a church, which is deemed as the most holy or the sanctissimus, was an important ritualized space in early medieval Irish ecclesiastical settlements. But the larger renowned monasteries which benefited from royal patronage certainly accommodated more than 12 monks. We read in the Irish annals, the Viking raid on the monastery of Iona in the year 806 resulted in the entire population of the abbey, then at 68 people, being massacred. Not only, not, not all these individuals would have been professed monastics, however, a good number would have been quasi clerics who supported the community as food providers and administrators. However, this figure gives us a sense of the size of a large monastery that's situ situated on a relatively small island. We can expect other monastic communities, such as, such as at Clonmacnoise, Bangor, Armagh, Clonard, as having larger communities as they, unlike Iona, were, were not islands, but were contiguous with important trade routes and roads, making them more accessible to larger numbers of people and also enabling them 
to have extensive land endowments and many workers who tilled the land and supplied their monasteries with the daily necessities. In terms of the internal arrangements and layout of monastic sites, we know that houses of hospitality featured as important buildings and places to receive guests. Houses of hospitality feature prominently in saints' lives, such as the life of Colum Killer and the life of St. Senon. We know that in secular law tracts, that a certain class of men, the hospit hospitaller, was given rights to operate public guest houses located on major public roadways, and that at one point there were six royal guest houses located on crossroads, each serving as a, as a refuge for individuals who had committed, among other crimes, the crime of bloodshed. A parallel might be drawn here between these secular guest houses and those that were set up on church settlements which also offered sanctuary and protection under church canonical law. The eighth century Irish collection of canon law, the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, refers to church settlements as cities of refuge and as places where laymen, adulterers, murderers, and others could seek sanctuary. Although it's quite clear that these people were restricted to a certain area of the tarmen or the sanctuary lands of the church and were not to be admitted to the Holy of Holies, the Sanctissimals. We know from other texts that a, that a key official in a monastic community was a guest house keeper, and a reference to such a keeper in the monastery of Armagh suggests that he enjoyed a relatively high status. Guest houses were kept by Senon and his community at Kilrush in Kogabashkin in Southwest Clare, and which are referred to in a series of 14th century poems as having been built by the pious Erkanuk, who was portrayed as a protector of St. Senon's rights. The responsibility of the Erkanucks or administrators in building guest houses mirrors a set of obligations stipulated in the eighth century rule of Patrick, which states that Erkanucks are to enforce provisions regarding the upkeep of the church, including its physical, physical fabric and its graveyards. So the role as building and maintaining St. Senon's guest houses is congruent with the other types of activities expected of them as important church administrators and overseers. The vengeance of St. Senon is palpable when, in a poetic exchange with another famous Clare saint, Inim Wee, the patron of Kilna Boy, St. Senon retorts that his abbots will be cursed if they abandon their role of looking after guest houses or if they diminish the renown of his hospitality. The keeping of hospitality was therefore considered an important duty of a monastery. And there was probably an element of prestige and status for a monastic community to be able to muster the resources in order to operate a guest house and render hospitality to both pilgrims and clerical guests. We should now focus our attention on the landscape of a monastic community. Landscape is important as it too was ordered in a specific way. Recent scholarship emphasizes the deliberate ordering of some of the larger monastic sites, such as Iona, so that they symbolically reflected the Holy Land and its important holy sites. In this context, one wonders if such an approach was undertaken sometime after the late seventh century when Adovnan, the ninth abbot of Iona, wrote a fascinating work about the holy places of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Turning now more specifically to the lands of the church, the church lands of Irish monasteries, many of them donated over many years to the church, were called in Irish tarman, which denotes sanctuary. We know something of these tarman lands because the word has been preserved into modern times and is often found adjacent to ancient church sites. We also have 17th century writings that record the extent of some of these tarman lands, which has survived as parcel of church lands down to that time. But we also have early evidence of how these tarman lands were arranged and delineated in the early medieval period. A schematic plan of a monastery has been preserved in the 8th century Book of Mulling, in which it shows how some communities marked out their tarman lands. Here, crosses are arranged within and around a monastic enclosure, itself shown by a double circle. The marking out of church settlement with crosses finds support in the 8th century Irish canons. In an entry about the boundary of a holy locus or consecrated place, we are told that an Irish synod had decreed that the boundary of a holy locus should have signs around it. It goes on to state that wherever you find the sign of Christ's cross, you shall not be offended. This could be taken as positively permitting the erection of high cross markers on tarman lands of a monastery. 
If we turn our attention to the Church of Kilfenora in northwest County Clare, itself an ancient site and recorded in the Irish annals as having been burnt in the year 1055, it too was surrounded by, by stone high crosses, some of which survive to this day. It is thought that the arrangement of these crosses around Kilfenora denoted its Tarman lands and was where guests and clergy had right of sanctuary. The arrangement of crosses, and perhaps the Tarman lands more generally, has been interpreted to indicate progressive levels of holiness, the sanctus, the sanctator, and the sanctissimus, essentially a grading of different degrees of sanctity within the monastic complex. The idea here being that the church and its saintly relics was enclosed by a small division, sometimes a physical enclosure, and that this was the sanctissimus, or the most holy place in the monastic community. Under early Irish law, the Tarman lands also had important legal standing, whereby convicted persons could seek sanctuary on these lands, and within which clerics were accorded special protection. On Tarman lands, it was ecclesiastical, not secular law, that prevailed. As we have seen in the example of Kilfenora, one way of showing these delineations was through the erection of high crosses, and we have examples of these still standing at some early church sites in Ireland. One of the best known is at Monaster Boyce near Drogheda, where its three surviving carved crosses were probably erected as much for their beautiful artistry and iconography as for other reasons which we've already alluded to. At Kilnaboy, a church in Central Clare, one surviving Tarman marker was a small towel-shaped cross that's situated two kilometres from the church on its western side and seems to have marked the western boundary of the church lands of St Inin We. In terms of church organisation, we know little about how the church was organised and took shape in the time of St Patrick's mission of the 5th century. It appears that due to his activity and legacy, a diocesan system with deacons, priests and bishops was established. This is not surprising as it reflected the organisation of the church in the Roman Empire and especially in its urban areas. We know from early synods held in Ireland that, and from their decrees that the diocesan system expanded over the centuries and that bishops had an important place in ruling over territorial dioceses. As there were no urban centres in Ireland at the time, these dioceses collased around the Tuha, or the native polities. However, by the 8th century, the diocesan system appeared unworkable in the decentralised Irish social and political context. And instead, what emerged was a hybrid system whereby monastic communities tended to be the main, although not the only locus of church activity. Many of these monasteries were headed by an abbot, who was sometimes also a bishop. Some historians have viewed the Irish church from the 8th century as being an exclusively monastic church, but this is missing the point. We have clear evidence in synodal decrees that bishops were still important sources of authority and presided over synods and were required to ordain priests and of course consecrate churches and undertake other episcopal functions. And in terms of authority in the Irish church, it is stipulated in the 8th century collection of Irish canon law, the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, that if matters could not be resolved in local synod, then they are to be referred to, to the Pope as a patriarch of the Latin church. We see this in a letter to Pope Innocent I sent by the renowned Irish cleric, cleric Cumin in the year 633. His letter was sent because an Irish church synod could not resolve the issue regarding the calculation of the date of Easter. His letter was seeking to understand the practice of the universal church, and shortly after this, the southern churches in Ireland adopted the Roman calculation. The northern churches, led by Ona, however, took, on, took a longer period to accept the Roman calculation. This period of consolidation of the early, early Irish church saw a growth in the primacy of Armagh, Kildare, and Clonmacnoise three ecclesiastical centres which had emerged with claims to authority within their respective territories. Iona emerges as a leader of the northern churches, but his reputation spread as far as Northumbria in England and indeed beyond, partly due to the great reputation of St Colum Killer or Columba, its sixth century founder, and also the fact that it was truly an intellectual powerhouse in the sixth to eighth centuries. It was at Iona that the early Irish annals or chronicles were kept, a practice which spread to other monasteries in Ireland and had far reaching consequences for the recording of Irish history. In fact, in Western Christendom, the Irish appear to have been 
the earliest to establish a monastic chronicle which recorded obituary notices as well as key events, especially relating to politics and the church. It is thought that a collection of annals were first compiled from the sixth century at the monastery of Iona, perhaps directly as a result of Colum Killer or his immediate successors. And this continued down to the 10th century, when at that point, a number of annals continued as separate narratives, such as those which we call nowadays as the annals of Inish Fallon, the annals of Ulster, the annals of Colmac Noyce, and so on. I'm going to briefly touch on an important aspect of the early Irish church that is sometimes ignored, or at least glossed over by historians, and that is of belief. We can state unequivocally that the fundamental beliefs and praxis of the Irish church were in line with that of the universal church. We can see in some of the earliest writings of the Irish church, such as the first synod of St. Patrick, attributed perhaps to the sixth century, the laying down of church canons, many of which display the type of concerns that we find in churches elsewhere on the continent. In these writings, there is little evidence of heresy or heterodoxy. Considering Ireland's distance from other major centers of Christianity, it is perhaps remarkable at how orthodox the Irish were at this period. It may have been their consciousness of being so distant from the other major centers of Christianity that the Irish were so keen to follow universal church practice. We have much evidence, more than anywhere else north of the Alps in Europe, that in the early Irish canons of the eighth century, clerics were very well read in the Patristic Fathers, biblical exegesis, and that they were well versed in biblical history. For example, Asubius's history and Isidore's chronicles and etymologies to name but a few works used by the Irish at this period. When we think about belief in the early medieval Irish church, the main point that I want to make here is that the Eucharist was central to Irish theology, just as it was in the universal church. The real presence of the, in the Eucharist is referred to in the mid eighth century poems of Blamach, which were composed by an anonymous cleric and which focus on the life, crucifixion and resurrection of Christ and the doings of the apostles. Saints' lives are also replete with evidence that the Eucharist was believed as a body and blood of Christ. Historians have focused on two distinct features of the Irish church that made it somewhat out of step with some of its continental churches. The first was a different calculation of Easter, which was infamously resolved at the Synod of Whitby in the year 664. Remember earlier when I mentioned that the Easter tables were first introduced to Ireland by Palladius's mission of the 5th century, and which were at that time the practice of the church in Gaul. The Irish stuck to the, that method of calculation until it became untenable by the 7th century. The other difference was that of the type of tonsure used in some of the Irish monasteries, and that it differed from that used elsewhere. This might seem a fairly marginal issue from our standpoint today, but it was perhaps a visible reminder of the difference which made that practice somewhat controversial for its contemporaries. We, we really begin seeing the Irish church flourish from the year 700 onwards. This is in contrast with what we find in England or indeed much of Europe north of the Alps, which was primarily non-Christian, even those territories which, under the earlier Pax Romana, were Christian and had a vigorous urban Christian culture. By the seventh, cent seventh century, uh, many such areas had re reverted to non-Christian religions, partly on account of invasion and colonization by non-Christian peoples from Northern Europe, as we find happening in much of England in the wake of the Anglo-Saxon settlement. Whilst we have Bede, working away in the kingdom of Northumbria at Jarrow, in many respects, we don't find a similar network of scholarship among the English, or indeed among the French and others at this time, which was comparable to that which was found in Ireland. In Ireland, by contrast, we have many texts that were the produce of the monastic schools during this period, and that the development of literature in Irish continued apace. As an indication of the growth in scholarship in Ireland, we find that by the second half of the 7th century, it is clear that book production in Ireland was extensive. From this time, we have a number of surviving books, and no doubt there were many more. Those surviving books, or more properly called liturgical manuscripts, include the Antiphonary of Bangor, which was compiled around the year 680. There was also evidence of non-liturgical materials being copied at this early period, 
And we have evidence from a fragment of an Irish text of the ecclesiastical history by Asubius, which shows that the Irish mon monastics were interested not simply in liturgical, but also historical texts containing both religious and also secular themes. From the year 700, the church expanded significantly in Ireland, and by virtue of this, we have a corpus of evidence for its activity. One reason for the expansion was that many churches began as proprietary churches, which means that they were founded by a lineage group to serve that particular group. In a kin-based dynastic society, which Ireland was at this period, this type of foundation was common. It was incentivized under early Irish law, which vested property rights collectively in a kin group. This means that if they donated land to the church, the entire kin had to consent to its alienation. And therefore we often find that whole families held their land from the church, whilst also providing the clergy to that particular church foundation. This practice continued in a variety of ways down to the 17th century. And we find many Irish surnames connected to the church or its lands through such a process. Indeed, my own surname serves as one such example of this. This granting of land to the church by lineages and whereby whole families join the church, that is setting themselves up as an ecclesiastical lineage, has been described as one of the most important watersheds in the growth of church power in Ireland. In the context of donation, the written will or testament was an attempt to override the normal rules of inheritance by making separate provisions for individuals or institutions such as a church to benefit when they ordinarily would not. The earliest records of land donations to the church are found in a charter, uh, in charter material, which dates from the second half of the seventh century and copied into the book of Armagh. By encouraging whole families to embrace religious life, or at least set up monasteries on their land, the church mitigated the difficulties involved in alien, alienating land belonging collectively to a kindred. Under this situation, the quid pro quo was that these families supplied the clergy to the church or monastery that's situated on their property and that they benefited, benefited because church lands were exempt from secular taxation. This arrangement appears to have been particularly attractive for lineages who were losing political power and wanted to bolster their status by embracing the church, its authority and its learning. It is this set of factors that gave rise to what is called the propriety church, which essentially is a system that enabled land to be alienated to the church whilst at the same time allowing the foundation family, the founding family to retain a vested interest in it, such as having the privilege of supplying the head of the church or administrating the lands of the, of the, of the church. Propriety churches were common in Europe at this period, but in Ireland, family or hereditary control over churches resulted in generational control by a specialist class of hereditary administrators who had a deep connection to a particular church site or saint's cult. Remarkably, some of these hereditary church families continued to be involved in ecclesiastical affairs right down to the 17th century. From the 8th or 9th century, we, we begin to record in the Irish annals numerous church of offices connected with administration of monastic centres and their lands. For example, we begin to hear about the office of the Corba or Corb and the Erknach. These were hereditary church administrators who ensured that the fabric of the churches were upkept and levies paid to the churches. As we have mentioned, some of these officers were restricted to a particular family who had donated land to the church or were closely involved in its administration. Such families held the offices of Corb and Erichnach hereditarily and transmitted those offices among their descendants down the generations. And many of these hereditary administrators continued right down to the 16th century and they were seen as a link to the medieval church. For example, the modern surnames of O'Daignan and O'Hogan had Erknach origins, or the Tomond surname, Makinerni, which in Irish is Makinerni, indicates its origins from an Erknach progenitor. Possibly the most important aspect of organization of the Irish church in the seventh to 10th centuries was a growth of what we call monastic confederations, the Perusia. This means a jurisdiction of a mother house over smaller monasteries and churches. Several emerged and sometimes their claims were disputed between each other. We have Armagh, which of course had the prestige of having St. Patrick's remains removed from Downpatrick. We also have Clonmacnoise and Kildare. We also have the rise of Iona and what is called the Columbian Parusha, which stretched from the Western Scottish Isles to the monastery of Durrow in central Ireland. <clears throat> 
So these confederations were not always contiguous and they appear to have followed their own monastic rule. Other important, another important development to note from the year 700 onwards is that we begin to see a significant increase in the documentary evidence of the church. The Irish produced the earliest penitentials in Europe, which sets out a system of private confession to a priest and levied a series of appropriate penances. We also see some of the first monastic rules set down, such as the rule of Columbanos, which was a rather severe rule and certainly much stricter than the rule, than the contemporaneous rule of St. Benedict. The rule of Columbanus was exported to France, Switzerland, and Italy by the Irish monks in the seventh century. And it is interesting to note that many of these earlier Irish foundations under the rule of Columbanus eventually adopted the rule of St. Benedict. Nevertheless, the rule of Columbanus allows us to get a sense of these early strict Irish rules and the type of concerns and community life which they envisaged. By this period of our study, the Irish church had consolidated its influence in Ireland. Although of a later period, around the beginning of the ninth century, we have a poem written in Old Irish in a compilation called the Martyrology of Angus, which is the earliest metrical listing of saints and their feast days in Irish. This poem, which is all about the downfall of heathendom, might be considered somewhat of a window on the conversion process of earlier centuries. At any rate, the fact that it was written in the early ninth century shows that the institutional church was confident both of itself and of its own standing in society. I'll read out just a handful of verses translated by Frank O'Connor, which speaks to this self-confidence. Naventown is shattered, ruins everywhere. Glendalock remains, half a world is there. Old haunts of the heathen, filled from ancient days, are but deserts now where no pilgrim prays. Heathendom has gone down, though it was everywhere. God, the Father's kingdom, fills heaven and earth and air. One further thing to say about the conversion process and the original appeal of Christianity is that about the role of technology and management in making the church a pivotal element in the economy and daily life of people. A reoccurring question in the study of conversion is whether arable farming was more associated with the church than pastoral farming. The idea here is that churches tended to be exploiters of cereal production, which conferred on them greater agricultural surplus and thus economic power. Technology is also important, and we see some scholars pointing to the early presence of horizontal water mills, such as at sites like Little Island in County Cork, or the presence of a 7th century horizontal tidal mill at Nendrum in County Down, as evidence of advanced management and the application of technology in running monastic farms and food production. We don't know how much any of this helped actual conversion, but the weight of evidence points to efficient management and application of new technology, much like the Cistercians would do in later centuries, which certainly improved the standing of the church economically, having a literate and dedicated class of church administrators who could exchange ideas between churches and observe and copy ideas and technologies from elsewhere in the very least help to enhance the prestige of the church. One positive externality in this respect might have been to gain greater converts as this mix of dedication, know-how and mission virtuously combined to impress new converts and ensure that the church was an institution here to stay with a collective institutional memory, skilled personnel and the wherewithal to make good of their resources and land endowments in an environment that was politically fragmented. In Sola Sanctorum et Doctorum, the island of saints and scholars. This reference was first written by Marinus Scotus, an Irish monk in the 11th century in Germany. And it sums up the early period quite pithily, albeit with more than a hint of hyperbole. Ireland's golden age produced three great saints who were very influential, both in the history of Ireland and also in the case of Columbanus in European history. Whilst I cannot do justice to their legacy, I shall endeavour to give but a thumbnail sketch of each. The first to mention is Column Killer, or St Columba, who was born 
sorry, who died in the year 597. He was a native of Donegal and was born into a royal family. He was a poet and was well versed in the native tradition of poetry and Shenachus, or history. He got into a dispute with St. Finian about the copying of a manuscript, and some refer to this as the first copyright case in history. And due to the ensuring tensions, he exiled himself to Iona off the western coast of Scotland, where he established an important monastery that was responsible for the Christianization of much of Scotland and northern England. There exists a Latin Psalter from the 6th century, which is believed to be in the hand of Colin Killer himself. It was preserved as a reliquary tr shrine, and it was taken into battle by the O'Donnells, who claimed Colin Killer as a distant ancestor. For this reason, the reliquary became known as a Cahach, or the Battler. The Psalter itself is the earliest Latin writing in, in Ireland which has survived. We can learn a lot about the life of Iona, the monastery which Colin Killer founded, from the biography or the life of Colum Killer, the Vitae Columbi. In this, we learn that the saint was skilled in time reckoning, what we call computus, or the calculation of time through mathematics and astronomy, especially the date of Easter, so that the liturgical calendar was correctly adhered to. This was of great concern among the Irish, and much scholarly activity during this period was absorbed in producing works on computus and constructing Easter tables to aid calculations of time through the observation of the celestial bodies. But the Irish, unlike their continental counterparts, also observed the tides. And we read in a 10th century Irish text, the Psalter Naran, that knowledge of the tides is listed among the five things which an ecclesiastical scholar should know on a daily basis. To this was also added knowledge of the solar month, the age of the moon, as well as dates of religious festivals. We also learn from the Ovra Columcilla, or the Canticle of Columcilla, which could be from the seventh century, that Columcilla was skilled in the books of law, and that not only was he skilled in the scriptures, but that he lent the scriptures among the schools. An interesting reference, which implies perhaps a teaching role. What is more impressive in that canticle claims that Colum Killer mastered Greek grammar. This is quite a significant claim, although it could simply be a claim without foundation. However, it does reflect an interest taken by the Irish in this early period about understanding the sacred languages and learning enough of their grammar to understand basic etymology and perhaps to read some of the patristic fathers. The Vitae Colum, Colum Columbi is probably the best evidence that we have of the internal workings of an Irish monastery. It tells us about the keeping of houses, of hospitality for visitors, the herding of cattle for milk and for meat, and that one monk was a blacksmith and that another, and that other tasks were carried out by members of the monastic community, which was self-sufficient and engaged in the daily routine of agricultural work, but also the intellectual work of copying liturgical books and other manuscripts. We even hear in the Vitae Columbi humorous anecdotes which must have reflected common happenings in such monasteries, such as a story about a monk who stood up and unwittingly dropped a book which he was studying into a water bucket, or another about how a small inkhorn was foolishly tipped over when a visitor came to greet Colum Killer, and at the moment of embracing the saint, the edge of the visitor's garment spilt Colum Killer's ink everywhere. The fact that the Vitae Columbi was written by the ninth abbot of Iona, Odovnam, confers a degree of credibility to the stories contained therein. The next saint I will touch on is indeed the same Odovnan who authored the Vitae Colum Colum Columbia. Odovnan died in the year 704, and he is sometimes known in Ulster under the anglicized name Unan. Like Colum Killer, Odovnan was from Donegal. Arvnan is known for promulgating the first human rights legislation in Europe that specifically protected women and children from the carnage of war. In the year 697, he got agreed the law known as a coin Arvnan, or the Lex Innocentium, to use its Latin name. He was the author of the life of Colum Killer, where he himself was serving as the abbot of Iona. And in a rather extraordinary work called De Locus Sanctus, or on holy places, he recounted a conversation he had with a bishop from Gaul who visited Iona, but previously had journeyed to the Holy Land. Adovnan wrote about what the bishop saw at the holy places in Palestine and included a plan of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This was a very influential work 
and archaeologists still use its insight, its insight today to identify monuments that were visible in Jerusalem during the seventh century. The third saint to say something about is Columbanus, or Columborn, the white dove who died in the year 615. Born in Leinster, he was attached to Bangor Monastery in Ulster. He traveled to Northern France where he founded a number of monastic houses which used his rather strict rule. His followers also founded an Irish monastery at St. Gallen in Switzerland, which became famed for its learning and a number of early Irish manuscripts has survived there. Columbanus wrote letters to the Pope about the calculation of Easter. He wrote in a very sophisticated and nurtured Latin. His letters show wide learning of classical authors and is often cited as, ev as evidence of the type of texts which the Irish had access to at a time when Latin learning was almost non-existent in many areas of the former Roman Empire in Western Europe. This very rich flowering of the Irish church went hand in hand with intellectual activity. Irish scholars developed a high reputation both in Ireland and in Europe. A number of Irish scholars contributed significantly to what is called the Carolingian Renaissance. To quote the view of the late scholar Richard Sharp, that by the ninth century, the Irish had effectively exported her Latin culture, culture to Francia. The most outstanding Irish scholar at the time was Johannes Erugina, who died in the year 877, who was regarded as the only scholar in the West who knew Greek properly and he authored a number of philosophical works. Around the, around the same time lived Sedulius Scotus, whose biblical commentaries were, were very well known and highly valued along with his grammar. And this occurred at a time when Viking raids in Ireland and Europe were devastating monastic libraries. One other remarkable individual who deserves to be mentioned is an anonymous Irish philosopher known as the Augustinus Hibernicus, who wrote a tract called De Mirabilius Sacri Scriptori in the year 665. What is remarkable about this seventh century cl clerical scholar is the idea that he had about miracles in that miracles were being thought of essentially in the wrong way in that they were being performed by God somehow through suspending or breaking the laws of nature. Augustinus Hibernicus thought much more about the natural processes in nature which is readily observable and can be explained in rational terms. Among his arguments, Augustinus argued that Ireland was anciently joined to the European continent and it was populated by animals crossing a land bridge. This explanation was many centuries ahead of its time. What is surprising with this argument is it was constructed on the basis of logical deduction and observation of coastal erosion. It also allows us somewhat of a window into Irish philosophical thought at this early period, which was clearly combining theoretical ideas with the obs observation of the natural world. It would be remiss of me not to say something about this great flowering of literary activity and scholarship, which I have mentioned. During the eighth to 11th centuries, much of the most active monastic scholars were located in the Midlands and in East Ulster. These tended to be monasteries that enjoyed patronage from the leading Irish dynasties and were located on the main trade routes. All of this mattered because the wealth of a monastery determined whether it could maintain a scriptorium or not. Scriptoria were very expensive. Just imagine that the production of books needed hundreds, potentially hundreds of calfskins to produce the requisite vellum. This required extensive, extensive land resources and specialist skills to prepare the vellum for writing. During this period, the type of literary production which the monasteries were engaging in was diverse. Not only were they undertaking biblical studies, but they were recording histories, translating classical texts into Irish, writing saints' lives, and compiling genealogies of the saints. Saints' genealogies were popular and pe peculiar to Ireland. One reason for this is that a saint's genealogy linked that particular saint not just to an ecclesiastical foundation, but also to a lineage group. I mentioned earlier how lineage groups founded churches and supplied the clergy. So having a saint linked to both the church and your own lineage group helped support claims which were advanced by a church or a particular monastery. Early writings in Latin included grammatical manuals. It is important to remember that Irish was the first language to be written in the vernacular from the 550s or so. We have many writings in both Old and Middle Irish, especially from the 10th century as Latin started to be used less 
Not only do we have many survivals of scriptural studies, saints' lives, and devotional literature, we also get a mass of secular or quasi-secular writings, such as chronicles, genealogies, mathematical texts, alongside, alongside native scholarship, such as place name studies or Din Hanichus, and poetry, Filiacht. The Irish produced a corpus of glossaries that focus on the etymologies of Irish words, the earliest of which, generally known as Omo Connery's glossary, dates from around the seventh century and is significant because it is earlier than anything comparable in Europe. Alongside these explanatory glossaries, the Irish monastic schools were producing grammatical treatises in Irish, which reflected classical Latin grammatical texts. Around the same time, it is striking that the Irish also attempted narrative literature. It has been proposed that the beginnings of vernacular literature and its writing in Irish started with the tale Octra Conley in the late seventh century. It is interesting to note that such tales, whilst secular narratives, were the fruits of the monastic schools who appear to have enjoyed diverse literary interests encompassing not simply religious, but also secular themes. A good example of this is a now lost manuscript book, book called Kindroma Shnokti, which contains a, a collection of tales and genealogies which was compiled at the church of Dromsnat in present-day Canning Monaghan during the 8th century. So when thinking about monastic schools, we need to be aware that they were both, they were both diverse and creative in their literary tastes, and that there was also a readiness to use pre-Christian motifs and stories and to retell them and use them in a sophisticated scheme that explains the origins of the Irish and their language. When doing this, however, we were also reminded that the authors were monastics and to this end, we see Christian Latin literary models interwoven in the texts as Irish churchmen also looked for literary models from the books of the Old Testament, including an emphasis on genealogy and history found in the biblical stories. It is important to bear in mind that the Bible was seen as the key book and the interpretation of natural science, that is the ob observation of nature, the tides and the reckoning of time, as well as the interpretation of history and how it should be told, were all considered through the paradigm of biblical teaching. So recounting of stories and the overall arrangement of history and its writing was done, first and foremost, with the Bible and its literary models in mind. Among the early writings and preoccupations of the Irish clerics was a genre of apocryphal writings. It appears that the Irish churchmen found them uh, interesting and that this is, quite a this is attested by the fact that a number of such works has survived and provides us with a more rounded view of the type of scholarship pursued in the Irish monastic schools. We have, for example, a fascinating text written in Old Irish known as Anchanga Bithnu, or the ever new tongue, which was based on the apocryphal acts of Philip. There existed a rich corpus of Irish apocryphal writings, some of them quite early, such as the so-called infancy narrative of Thomas, as well as other texts that gave a creative interpretation to the Psalms. Much of this scholarship came out of the Irish schools of, schools of exegesis within a monastic milieu, but they also show that Irish churchmen relish storytelling and engaging with religious texts. What we do know about the curriculum of the Irish schools is quite limited for this period. But we do have the words of St Augustine, which were reflected in a Middle Irish passage and gives us some indication of the type of scholarship pursued in these monastic schools. Augustine stated that four things were necessary for study. That is the divine canons, history, grammar, and numbers. A Middle Irish tract sets down the four divisions of knowledge for the poetic profession, and these were canons, grammar, history, and enumerating, although in this context canons were the Shanachas Ma and other native Irish texts. But from this we can see that the Irish took care to follow the church fathers and emulate their example, even in scholarship. The best known literature of this period appears not as a dedicated piece of literature per se, but as a humble note found in a ninth century manuscript written by an Irish monk at Reichenau Monastery in Southern Germany. It is a lovely poem that compares a monk's scholarship with that of his cat named Pangaborn. Born. 
just to give you a flavour of the language, I'm going to read out the first two stanzas in Old Irish. Before I begin, I should confess, I'm not an Old Irish specialist, so I stress that my pronunciation is only approximate. Misha August Pengaborn, Kakta Natha Freya Handorn, Beth of Enver Soy Free Shalig, Movenva Coin Am Hen Herd, Karoshe Foss Fur Guck Clu, Och Molavron Lea Inignu, Niforov Jack Frim Pangaborn, Karag Heshen Ah Vak Dorn. I and Pangaborn, my cat. Tis a like task we are at. Hunting mice is his delight. Hunting words, I sit all night. Better far than praise of men, tis to sit with book and pen. Panga bears me no ill will. He too plies his simple skill. And the poem goes on to say in translation, tis a merry thing to see at our tasks, how glad are we when at home we sit and find entertainment to our mind. Oftentimes a mouse will stray into the hero Panga's way. Oftentimes my keen thought sits, takes a meaning in its net. Against the wall he sets his eye, full and fierce and sharp and sly. Against the wall of knowledge I, all my little wisdom try. When a mouse darts from its den, oh, how glad is Panga then. Oh, what gladness do I prove when I solve the doubts I love. So in peace, our tasks we ply, Panga born, my cat and I. In our arts, we find our bliss. I have mine and he has his. Practice every day has made Panga perfect in his trade. I get wisdom day and night, turning darkness into light. The monastery where this monk wrote those wonderful verses had a scriptoria that became a seat of learning in Europe. Its early medieval Irish manuscripts having survived the centuries bear witness to the Irish scholarly element on this part of the continent. Monastic education in Ireland was overseen by what the Irish sources called lectors or sapiens, I can translate that as wise men, who were initially clerics at the same as time went on, the lectors became known in Irish as the Far Legan, which means man of learning or reading, but can probably better be translated as a textual scholar. By the end of our survey in the 1100s, many of these men of learning appear to have been secular scholars, although some debate remains as to how monastic were they. Some, such as a renowned Flan Monastruch, of Monaster Boyce, who died in the year 1056, were great scholars of learning and who were involved in the rather politicized scholarship of synthetic history. By this, it is meant a history that provided a background to the history of the Irish and how the kings of pre-Christian and Christian Ireland ruled, as well as their territories and peoples. This scholarship combined elements of the native Shenachus and Din Hanichus, as well as ecclesiastical chronicles and annals in producing king lists, which synchronize the Irish kings with those from classical antiquity and universal history. Very much using the template set down centuries earlier in the Asubius Jerome Chronicon. Flan himself was from an ecclesiastical service family, his father being a Farlean or lector, and one of his sons being the Erknach of Monaster Boyce. It was from this influential and intellectual group of monastic scholars that we find that many of the learned families of the later medieval period trace their origins to. This was not an insignificant development and the emergence of a bardic lawyer in historian class in, medieval, in the medieval period who came to be attached to the then great centers of power, such as the courts of, uh, the, courts of the Gaelic nobility and later also some of the Anglo-Norman families, often trace their ancestral origins among this scholarly monastic class of the 12th century or earlier. The fact that we have learned secular families who are professional specialists in history and law carrying on the compilation of annals down to the 16th century shows just how much the latter Gaelic literati owed to the influence of the pedagogical models of the 12th century monastic schools and their educated personnel. 
at its most simple, this shows us how in Ireland continuity in the scholarly tradition had deep roots indeed. Turning now to my last slide for the lecture. I'm not going to go into any great depth about the reform of the Irish church of the 12th century, but that it is relevant for our period of study. So I'll confine myself to making some general headline remarks. Whilst the so-called East-West Schism in the church occurred in 1054, its implications were not felt in Ireland until much later. And even then what was primarily felt in Ireland was a Gregorian or the Hildebrandine reform that emerged as a series of changes that aimed to reform and extend the temporal authority of the papacy, as well as implement new canonical laws as regards morality, marriage and clerical celibacy. The reform program was launched in the mid 11th century and can be partly seen as a way of augmenting the authority of the papacy in the wake of the schism with the Eastern churches. The effects of the Gregorian reform program were felt later in Ireland, but their implementation, aside from establishing new hierarchies in terms of the creation of a parish structure and diocese did not result in sweeping the older functionaries of the early monasteries completely aside. In fact, elements of this older system remained, at least at the parish and sub-parish level, down to the early 17th century in some places. For example, the presence of hereditary clerical families, the Erkinocks, holding church land on behalf of the bishops, continued in some Gaelic areas into the early 17th century, when some of them were granted leases on the newly reconstituted lands of the Church of Ireland. We begin to see the seeds of reform being sown in the Irish church from the late eighth century with the Cayley Day or the Caldee movement. It essentially wanted a greater return to the monastic ideal, that is greater asceticism. It appears that those monks who wished to follow this movement and their new rule did so either within their existing monastic houses or founded their own communities of stricture, stricter observance elsewhere. Their influence spread as far afield as Scotland but the origins of the movement lay in the monasteries of Tulla and Clondorkin near to Dublin. In the 11th and 12th century, there was, a ref there was a movement within the Irish church to preserve some of the best historical and antiquarian writings from the monasteries. These included not just religious tracts, but a large corpus of secular tracts, such as tales, histories, and many of them dating from pre-Christian times, but were modified to suit a Christian audience. We have surviving from this time the great compilations of the Book of Leinster and the Lara Nehidra from about the year 1100 and other great codices in Irish. In these compilations have been preserved some of the ancient pieces of Irish literature, such as, uh, such as the On the War Gawar Erin and the Toyambul Kulna. In some cases, we know the attitude of the monastic compilers to these mythological and legendary stories. In the Toy and Ball Corner, there is appended two colophons, one in Irish and one in Latin. The Irish colophon says a blessing on everyone who will study the Toyin faithfully and who won't add anything to it. So far, so normal. But the rather, rather revealing is the Latin colophon, which goes on to say, and I quote, but I who wrote this history, or rather fables, do not give credence to certain things in this history or fables. For certain things in it are the deception of demons. Certain things, however, are poetic fictions. Certain things resemble the truth and certain things do not. Certain things are for the enjoyment of fools. The change of tone between the Irish and Latin colophons is as stark as it is interesting. It would appear that whilst the monastic writer gave little credence to this traditional story. He was nevertheless careful to record faithfully the story. The same writer also copied elements of the Din Hanichus and some genealogies in the Book of Leinster, two texts whose very nature and variety encapsulates the native literary tradition. We may conclude therefore that the copyist had respect for the native tradition, which he was set on recording. And it was this respect for the native tradition that permeated the writings of these monastic scholars, but he did so through the prism of ecclesiastical and Latin learning, as this was a milieu in which they were imbued.
In 1101 and 1111, a series of church synods were held to reorganize the church along lines compliant with the Gregorian reforms of the Latin church. This saw an end of the native monasteries that may have been the stimulus for, for preserving some of the texts and the antiquarian writings. In a series of synods, it was decreed that the diocesan system was to be established. And from this time, we have the imposition of clerical celibacy. The number of bishops was reduced. And as a result, some monastic houses, such as Scattery Island and Mungret near Limerick, lost their episcopal status. Indeed, the last Bishop of Scattery died in the year 1188, after which this important site in the, river, in, the, in the Shannon River appears to have been refounded as a collegiate college of secular canons, probably sometime in the 13th century. Elsewhere, former Episcopal sites, such as Clon McNoise, were refounded under the Augustinian rule. Indeed, the Augustinian rule was most popular, was the most popular refoundation for these native monasteries. It has been argued that the Augustinians, who were secular priests and lived in a community and focused on pastoral work, reflected elements of the pre-reform native monastic clergy. Indeed, the refounding of these monastic sites under Augustinian rule may have been, at the very least in some cases, really just a case of donning on new monastic garb but without much fanfare or change, either in their activities or indeed their personnel. But what is, but a more recent view that has gained traction is that the refoundation of monastic sites by continental religious orders and the creation of a new diocesan uh, system saw such a reorganization, reorganization of, the, of the older Irish church that it was essentially tantamount to asset stripping. The monastic Tarman lands were annexed by the bishops, and we have direct evidence of this occurring at a synod in Connacht in the year 1210, and that the scholarship in the monasteries refocused prim primarily on Latin ecclesiastical scholarship, while an interest in native literature generally declined during this period. We don't know the exact details, but essentially the evidence suggests that very little in native scholarship occurred from the 12th century until it was revived in the mid 14th century by secular historian families, but who had a connection to the ancient monastic site of Clon McNoise. The general supposition by historians is that native scholarship was abandoned in favor of former monastic sites, in, sorry, in many former monastic sites, and that its study passed from the church to secular learned families who carried on the early tradition of scholarship that had previously characterized the older monasteries. With the Norman invasion of 1169, many lands of the older monasteries were confiscated and either secularized or regranted to, to Cistercians and other continental religious orders. From this period, the church in Ireland was reformed, but in many ways, the pre reform practice and organization of the church continued, especially in those areas under control of the native Irish kings. One wonders how much really changed at the local parish level. Certainly, the papal decrees on celibacy for parish clergy were generally ignored, and we have much evidence of this in the 15th century papal letters, which shows that celibacy was sometimes ignored even among the monastics, such as the Augustinians. One example will suffice to demonstrate this point. The Augustinian Abbey of Clare Abbey was dominated from the late 14th century to the mid 16th century by clerics from the clan Cra learned family of poets and chroniclers. A number of petitions to the papal cura survive from the 15th century seeking dispensations from the sons of abbots who wished to follow a clerical career. And it was from this very same family that a number of bishops of Killaloo were drawn from during the same period. So this serves as but one example of those enduring links between a church and the learned secular families during the late medieval period. For the rest of the High Middle Ages, the Irish Church in Ireland was essentially divided into two separate camps, with the counties around Dublin being the church among the English, or the Inter-Anglicos, and the rest of the country being the church among the Irish, or the Inter-Hibernicos. So I should like to bring this lecture to a conclusion now. We have touched on a number of broad themes regarding the early Irish church and has surveyed approximately 600 years of history. Invariably, this has meant that our survey has been rather superficial, but hopefully wide ranging. It's my hope that some of these topics discussed might encourage you to do further study of this extraordinary period of Irish history for which there is still much to learn from. I shall close now quoting the words of Donatus of Fisole, uh, 
of Italy, who was a ninth century Irish bishop, poet and writer, whose poem on Ireland brings to life some of the achievements of the early medieval Irish church and its scholars. And it shouldn't be lost on us that it was composed by one such scholar himself, a bishop whose verses were in Latin, but at the same time, whose tradition was indomitably Irish. The noble share of earth is a far Western world, whose name is written Scotia in the ancient books, rich in goods, in silver, jewels, cloth and gold, benign to the body in air and mellow soil. With honey and with milk flow islands, lovely plains, with silken arms, abundant fruit, with art and men. Worthy are the Irish to dwell in this their land, a race of men renowned in war, in peace, in faith. That concludes today's lecture on the early Irish church. On the next slide, you'll see a suggested reading list. Gaurav Maragav.